Yes. So my name is Fredrik Karlsson. I'm a professor in economics. And I primarily work in what you would call behavioral economics, applied to social issues such as uh, uh, environmental consumption, uh, uh, use of uh, antibiotics, etc. So I'm, I'm very interested in understanding why people do as they do and how we can affect people in different ways. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is economics of antibiotic resistance. And I'm going to do it in a, in a fairly broad manner. So, so I've, I've heard that you have a number of very specific questions. We'll try to handle those specific questions as well. And this is these four things is basically what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about introducing antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance as a social science problem. And I'm going to call it a collective action problem. Then I'm going to talk very briefly about the economic costs of antibiotic resistance. And then I'll go through a number of sort of factors that we know uh, affect the use of antibiotics and, and the development of, of antibiotic resistance. And finally, I'll talk about, I call it solutions, but it's definitely not solutions in terms of a new drug. It's more solutions in terms of policies to, to affect the use of antibiotics. I, before I define what a collective action problem is, I want to put up these three important facts uh, uh, on the board. The first is, is the fact that it's, it's quite easy to, to, to uh, uh, forget that antibiotics is, is really good. It's something that society needs. So, so there's a reason for why you want to use antibiotics. Second, and you guys should know all about this now, is that the use of antibiotics increases the likelihood of development of antibiotic resistance. And antibiotic resistance in itself is a bad. That's nothing good with that, okay? Now, a collective action problem or a tragedy of the commons problem is the fact that people, when they decide whether they want to use antibiotics or not, are basically going to compare the benefits and costs for themselves. Okay, what, what is the, the cost of being sick? What's the cost of taking antibiotics for myself? What are the benefits? People will make a judgment based on, on, on an evaluation of that. They would not tend to, to any great extent, take into consideration what would happen with society, what would happen with other people. And because they, in, under most normal circumstances, would not take that as into consideration, they will tend to use too much antibiotics from a social point of view. And that is what we call a, a tragedy of the commons or a collective uh, action, action problem. So the level of use of antibiotics in the society where we wouldn't regulate the use of antibiotics would be too high. And it would be too much antibiotic resistance in society. This is also something that we sometimes, now we use that word from time to time, sometimes we call it a negative externality. So an action of one single individual affects other people's uh, lives in, in, in negative ways, and there is no agreement on, on this effect. So the classical examples here would be environmental pollution. I drive my car, and when I'm driving my car, there is local air pollution effects that affect people, and there are small effects in terms of global warming that could affect the whole planet. That would be a negative externality. And for me as an economist, I see the use of antibiotics in the same manner. That using antibiotics resistance is a sorry using antibiotics is a negative externality because it's the increased likelihood of, of antibiotic resistance. And just as we have negative externalities, we could also think of that we have positive externalities. And maybe the best example there is, is vaccination. If I vaccinate myself, I not only increase decrease the likelihood that I get sick, I also decrease the likelihood that other people in, in society get sick. And I'll come back to to vaccination uh, as, as a solution later on. Now, in order to solve this problem, we need to take action, but we need to take action collectively, and that's why we call this a collective action problem. It's not sufficient that I stop driving my car to stop global warming. It's not sufficient that I stop taking antibiotics to stop the development of antibiotic resistance. We need to take actions in a joint manner. However, 
Once we have the case that we have people taking joint action together, there will always be incentives for individuals to what we call pre-write. So once we agree as a group, let's do this, there will always be incentives for each individual of this collective to not follow the rules, to break the law or, or to behave in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that is not in, uh, uh, as the way that we agreed upon. And we'll call that free riding. So each individual, even if you agree, each individual has incentives to use too much antibiotics. So collective action problems is then usually split into what we would call voluntary collective action problems, where we as individuals in society agrees on doing same things, and uh, collective action problems that are solved politically, where we actually institute rules and laws and regulations on what is allowed and what is not, not, uh, not allowed. And I'll talk about uh, uh, a number of examples of, of bo both these types. Now, as, 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 as I started, I'm a social scientist, right? So I'm, I'm not here to talk about how to develop new drugs, etc. I'm here to talk about this as a social science problem. And I think that social sciences has a number of things to, to help in, in when it comes to trying to solve or handle this problem. And first and foremost, if I look at my own research, it's about better understanding why people are doing what they're doing. And given that we know that, how can we then affect people to, for example, take less antibiotics or maybe even to prescribe less antibiotics? And in particular, and I'll focus on that, in particular, I think we have a lot to say about how to handle these collective action problems from a political point of view. What are the general rules and guidelines and, and maybe even taxes that we can implement in order to, to help us solve this this social problem. I also want to point out, and, and I, I understand that this is natural for all of you here in this room, but I want to point out that, that these collective action problems usually work at different levels. So we can talk about small scale local collective action problems. Think of a, 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 a lake where we have a tendency to take out too much fish, that would be a local problem and it would be fairly easy to handle that at a local level. There might be collective action problems that are a national problem. And then there are these ugly bastards that I call global or large scale collective action problems that basically involve the whole world. And antibiotic resistance is one, climate change is another one, biodiversity at the big scale is most likely another one, uh, uh, so ecosystem, etc. So there are a number of collective action social problems that are really large scale. And I want to point out maybe the fourth here on, on the slide here, but just let me just very quickly say the first ones. The first one is the obvious one. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of countries that are involved, if it's a global problem, which also means that each single individual has a very little impact on this thing. It doesn't really matter what I do as an individual. <laughs> and it also means that it's very difficult to monitor. But what makes antibiotic resistance a little bit different from many of the other large-scale collective action problems is that it is what we call a weakest link problem. And what I mean by that is that if we compare climate change, if 95% of the world's countries agreed on reducing their emissions drastically, we would most likely solve climate change and global warming. If 90-95% of the countries in the world agreed on drastic reducing the, the use of antibiotics, we would most likely not solve the problem of antibiotic resistance because resistance would spread from the countries that do not take action. So antibiotic resistance is actually a much more complicated problem from a social point of view than, 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 than climate change, because we need almost everybody to be on board. Of course, there would always be a, a threshold where it would be fine if it's just one single island in the world that doesn't do anything, right? But, but it, it means that it is a, it's a pretty particular problem. Now, having said that, I won't talk much about global uh, uh, arrangements for, for, for uh, handling uh, antibiotic resistance. Then let me, even briefer, just 
talk a little bit about the economic cost of antibiotic resistance. And I'm actually going to focus on a very particular thing. Um, and I want to do this just to, so that you get a sense of what, what would be the social costs uh, uh, for society if uh, uh, antibiotic resistance develops more than what it is today. And I'll talk about a, a, a RAND study that was done a few years ago called Estimating the Economic Costs of Antimicrobial Resistance. And the, the fun and the interesting thing about this study is that it really tries to look at the economic cost at a global level. And it focuses only on two things. Well, actually only on one thing. It actually focuses only on the stuff that we produce in the world. Okay? So it focuses on what we call labor supply. Because development of antibiotic resistance will mean that people will die sooner than later, and people will be sick more often. And those two things will have an effect on what we can produce in an economy. So this is very similar to when we estimate, say, the cost of climate change. Major effects of climate change will mean that we will have loss in agricultural production. We would have, have uh, to spend money protecting our, uh, our, our cities from flooding, etc. It would take away productive resources. And it's the same with this study. It's looking at what happens, the, sorry, the major effect of antibiotic resistance that they look at here is what is the effect on what we produce in the economy. So this means, of course, that there are a bunch of things that are not included in these numbers. And in particular, what is not included is sort of the suffering uh, 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 that people have from being sick more often, from that, that people actually die. And they look at, uh, uh, at five different regions in the world. So OECD, uh, uh, European Union, Latin America, those countries that are not the OECD, the MENA region, uh, Eurasia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And they look at, at first, the, the baseline. And the baseline, it, it, I mean, it, it's, we already know this is not true, but the baseline that, that is sort of it is today, which they call no resistance scenario. So they're, they're sort of assuming that there is no resistance today, which is not true. Then they look at a case where, OK, what happens if there is only a small increase in, 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 in the rate of resistance, uh, up to 5%? Then what they call a normal case, 40%, and then the worst case, 100%. What would be the cost of society for these three cases compared to the baseline? And again, mind you, in terms of loss of productive resources in the economy, that's all. And they look at, what is it? It's, well, they look at more than these years that I have here. Uh, they look at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, if I, if I don't remember completely wrong. Uh, these numbers that you, see, uh, that you see here are numbers compared to the baseline. Okay? What would be the reduction in production in these five different, uh, sorry, six different regions uh, under the normal case of 40% resistance, and the worst case, 100% resistance. And I don't, I'm not showing you these numbers because I want you to sort of remember 3.41, etc. in this region. I'm showing you these because they, first of all, suggest that, I mean, it, it won't mean that the world will go under <laughs> if, if, we, if we have increased antibiotic resistance in terms of production. But it also, it will mean that we will in certain parts of the world, lose a fair share of our productive capacity. That's the first thing. The second thing I why I wanted to show you this is that if you, you see numbers in media, for example, about climate change, you will see that these numbers would be roughly the same as the cost of climate change. So if we estimate sort of the economic cost of antibiotic resistance, and if we estimate the cost of uh, climate change, not climate change, but global warming, they would be roughly of the same magnitude. That's all I'm going to say about economic cost, actually. So that's all sort of the, all, these are the only numbers that you will see from me, uh, which might be a surprise. Now, what I wanted to do now, and this is now I'm moving away a bit uh, from economics. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to go through, I think it's four or five areas, 
where, where I'll think and I'll go through the literature and, th- and s- sort of see what are the factors that people have said affect the use of antibiotics and the development of anti- antibiotic resistance. And the reason why I want to do that is that I think that it's important to understand the factors in order to talk about the solutions, okay? So it's still not a lot of economics, but it will come. Before I do that, uh, uh, there are a few important insights from a social science point, uh, point of view that I think is important to be aware of here. Uh, the first one is that this is a multi-source problem. And that's the one health insight that I have here first. We will have development of antibiotic resistance from many different sources. And you can apply exactly the same logic as the number of countries here. Uh, You can apply that to the number of sources here as well. It will be a weakest link problem here as well. If we deal with two of the sources but don't deal with the third source, it will still be a big problem. So we need to take care of the whole picture here in order to, to address this. This means, and that's the second insight, this means that most likely there is no single fix to this problem. So we, we need to sort of handle things at different sources, different types of behavior. We need to think about different types of solutions for different, different settings. And but don't forget this insight, which is still, I mean, antibiotics is good. Don't forget that, that, that people need antibiotics. Now, I'll do this fairly quickly. I want to talk about, I think it's four different areas, actually. Uh, I want to talk about sort of what are the main uh, uh, factors that, can, that, uh, that would be important for explaining behavior of people and the development of antibiotic systems. The first set of factors, I call them environmental factors. And the first thing I have up there is large populations and overcrowding. Because large population and overcrowding will tend to mean that people are sick more often. It will t- tend to mean that diseases will spread more quickly, which will mean that we will use more drugs than otherwise. The second one is the ability to travel, which will mean that people, since travel, transport costs have decreased drastically over the years, people will travel more often, which will mean that Bacteria, diseases will spread more easily than what it did before. Third, and this is now moving to developing countries, poor sanitation is most likely a huge factor explaining uh, the use of antibiotics. And fourth, and I won't talk much about that, I will have a few slides about that when I talk about that, but it's the use of antibiotics in in agriculture and in, in animal husbandry. So these are four big factors that we need to think about when you think about uh, the use of antibiotics, when it comes to environmental factors. When it comes to what I call patient factors, there are also a number of of important factors. The first one is that people might not not, not adhere to the dosage requirements uh, uh, that, that the doctor prescribed them to. It might be that people self-medicate, they, they buy the drugs online or they borrow drugs from their sister or whatever. It might be that people actually don't have the right information on what is the appropriate behavior. And they might, for example, think that, that they would need antibiotics when they don't need it. Uh, which is, of course, pretty closely linked to lack of education and maybe even, even poverty. So again, five important factors explaining behavior and the use of antibiotics and development of antibiotic systems. Third, doctors aren't always good. <laughs> uh, they, they might actually sometimes be the culprit here as well. So there might be a few prescriber factors that we might want to look at. There might be economic incentives for doctors to over-prescribe antibiotics. Uh, what I have in mind here is, for example, well, maybe there are incentive systems in place that, 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 that uh, uh, rewards doctors for using antibiotics. Or maybe they see this as a quick fix of, of, of problems instead of having a patient coming back again and again. 
It might be that uh, the doctors actually don't have sufficient information about certain settings. And third, it might be difficult for doctors when they face social norms in society that are saying one thing and they, uh, they need to either fight those social norms or, 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 or go with the flow and accept the social norms. And, and this was related to the first one, uh, the use of antibiotics is, of course, a substitute to, to uh, infection control. Lastly, what I call drug factors. And there are two uh, important things here. One is the availability of drugs. So the availability of drugs is most likely an important factor for explaining overuse of antibiotics. And the second is the development of new antibiotics. Or actually, I mean, it could be other things than new antibiotics. It could be new, new, new type of treatments that might not be related to antibiotics. So these are one, two, three, four. There were four. Four different areas with a number of different factors that can explain why there is overuse of antibiotics and why there is development of antibiotic resistance. And they're all based sort of from a social point of view, right? I haven't looked at sort of the, the medicine part of this. Now, what I want to do now is to think about these factors, think about these areas, and, and discuss a number of solutions. And the way I'll do that is that I'll, I'll define a number of different policies and then I'll just go into one of these areas and one of these factors and, and talk about that. So I won't talk about uh, all these factors. But before I do that, let me just g give you a sort of a flavor of how I think or how we as economists think when we think about something that we call policy evaluation. So what should we do in a society? What policies should we have? Well, as a scientist, I then, first of all, need to sort of know, well, what, what is the goal? What is the goal of the policy? Is it to reduce the use of antibiotics with 5% or, or is it to, to uh, stop antibiotic resistance or what, what is the goal? I need the goal in order to evaluate what I should do. Once I have the goal, and I mean, from a social point of view, that goal is not set by me as a researcher, it's set by society by our politicians or, uh, or by you as, as citizens. What should we do? Once uh, uh, we have a goal, the way I think about it then is this. I have this goal. How can I achieve this in the cheapest way possible? Okay? That's what I mean by cost efficient up there on the slide. And with cost efficient, I don't mean money only, okay? It could be the goal, the policy that you does this in the simplest way for, for individuals. It could be the, uh, the solution that, that uh, sort of is simplest for the patient, even if it's more costly from a monetary point of view. So I don't mean cost-efficient in a, in a narrow money-wise uh, 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 term. However, from a social point of view, it might not be easy to sort of know, well, what should be the goal? Well, in order to determine what should be the goal, I would also need to talk about the benefits and costs of reaching different levels of the goal. But I won't, I won't really talk about that, because that's, that complicates things a little bit more. So what, what would be the appropriate level of uh, carbon dioxide emissions for Sweden, or what would be the appropriate level of use of antibiotics for Sweden? It's a much more complicated question than answering what should we do for a given goal. Now, there are two complications for antibiotic use uh, that we need to be able to handle. The first one is the uncertainty. We don't know exactly what will happen if we do this. There are pretty large uncertainties with any policy that we do, with any change in behavior that we do. So there will be uncertainty and risk, and we need to be able to handle that. that com that's the complication number one. Complication number two is that 
These goals, these policies, not only affect us that are in this room that live today, it will also affect future generations. So how should we think about this? Should we care about future generations at all, or, or should we just think about what's good and bad for us that lives today? Most people would say, no, we should most likely care about future generations. How should we do that then? Should they be seen as equals to us, those that live in the future? Or, or how do we know that they will think and like what we like? How, how do we know what level of income they will have in the future, etc.? So that's the same sort of second complication of thinking about policies, risk and future generations. But even if it's more complicated, I would say it's a sort of the same principle. Let's compare benefits, let's compare costs, and decide what we should do. I, I usually say that there, are, that there are three most important solutions. Uh, and the first one is to get the incentives right. The second one is to get the incentives right. And the third one is to get the incentives right. Okay? If you do that, everything will be solved. Now, this sounds like a very economist point of view of looking at this. And again, I don't mean incentives only in terms of money. So, so when, I, when I use the word incentive, I mean that people will react to different stimuli in the environment. We will react to money. We will react to social norms. We will react to, to quality of life. We will react to what the doctor is suggesting or, or what the doctor is not suggesting, etc. We will react to a number of different things. And in order to affect people's behavior, we need, in the right direction, we need to get these incentives right. I want to talk about five different ways of changing behavior, five different ways of affecting the, the incentives. The first one is simply to forbid stuff. You're not allowed to do this. You're, you're not, we don't allow plastic bags anymore in the store, period. That's what we would call a ban or a mandate. Second one is to introduce economic incentives, so monetary incentives, for example, using a tax on certain types of behavior, on the use of, of uh, carbon, uh, carbon uh, sorry, on the use of fossil fuels, on the use of antibiotics, or whatever. Third one is to provide people with information, giving them information in order to affect their behavior. This is drama, right? Fourth is to give them a decision support, so getting it easier for people to do the right thing. And the fifth is what I call the decision environment. This is about affecting the actual, mostly physical decision environment that we act in and see if we can affect people in, 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 in that environment. And you all know the answer to this question, right? That's, that's an easy. Now, before I go into these, uh, uh, these, I just wanted to, if, if, you would, if you would ask people, sort of, well, what should we do in order to solve this, uh, solve this problem, most people would have these uh, five things on their list, that would be my guess. Might not always be on top five, but these would be things that people would say, this is really important to get, get right. So improve public health, improve sanitation, infection control, etc., and vaccination, not the least. Phase out the use of antibiotics in agriculture, for, for, at least for growth purposes. Uh, affect incentives for prescriptive drugs. Uh, affect incentives uh, 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 for, for, for use of antibiotics. And investments in new drugs. And I'll come back to each of these factors. And the way I'm going to do that is that I'll talk of at least the two first and the last one, and I'll apply these policies to each of these, these sort of uh, factors. So, the first I want to talk about is economic incentives, and I'm going to talk about that in the setting of vaccination. So one pretty standard, uh, uh, policy 
for reducing diseases, in particular in poor countries, is to get people vaccinated. Now, and this is actually one of the research areas where, where the research group that got the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, uh, yesterday or, or two days before they uh, got the prize for. They were looking at how can we get poor people to increase the uptake of vaccination in vaccination programs. And one of their key findings was that, well, in, by rewarding households to, to vaccinate, so not only provide, even the, you would provide vaccination for free, we would know that a number of people would not take the vaccine. But by introducing very small incentives for vaccination, we can see a pretty big increase in uptakes of vaccination uh, in these programs. And the reason why we want to do that is that these vaccinations will provide a positive externality. It will reduce the, uh, the, the extent of the diseases, which will mean that it will reduce the use of antibiotics. So there are sort of two positive externalities of having a vaccination. People will be sick, fewer people will be sick, and there will be less use of antibiotics. The second uh, is looking at agriculture. So how can we reduce the use of antibiotics in agriculture? And I'm going to talk about two different solutions here. The first one is what I talked about, that we could simply think of a solution where we ban the use of uh, antibiotics for animal growth promotion. Or you can formulate this actually in, in another way, no, not, in an, in an, not formulate, another option would be to ban all uses of antibiotics that are not under the super, supervision of a veterinarian. And both of these policies have been implemented in, in, different, country, in different countries in, the, in, in Europe. For example, in Sweden, in Denmark, and uh, the Netherlands. Now, banning has a number of very clear and simple advantages. By banning, we sort of know the effect. By saying you are not allowed to use antibiotics for this purpose anymore, as long as people follow the rules, they will stop taking, using antibiotics for that purpose. And we know if we looked at studies, we know that if we introduce that type of ban, it will reduce the use of antibiotics, and it will slow the development of antibiotic resistance. The problem with this type of policies is that it's the strength that is very crude is also the cost. It's usually very costly from the farm level point of view to have a very simple rule that says you're not allowed to use this at all. So these policies are usually very costly. It usually affects the effectiveness of our agriculture. Uh, and it usually also means that we would have to spend more money on, on infection control. And if, I think if you think about sort of a modern agriculture with the animals living very tight together, you can see why, why people would like to use antibiotics, right? So an alternative to this, would be to have what I call a user fee instead. And for now, a user fee for non-human use, okay? We could talk about the user fee for human use as well. But, but what has been discussed in the literature is a user fee for non-human use. So what do I mean by that? Well, I basically mean that we would tax antibiotics. We would increase the cost of antibiotics for non-human use. This is an economic incentive. By increasing the price of antibiotics, we will have a reduced use of antibiotics. And by the reduced use of antibiotics, we would have reduced uh, uh, development of, of antibiotic resistance. Now, the advantage of a user fee or a tax compared to a ban is that you let people themselves decide whether it's worth it or not. This is what I mean by sort of the, the second point here. Uh, 
that a user fee targets the low value users and the high value users, users that think this is still worthwhile, can pay the user fee and use the antibiotics. So you can sort of better sort the value of the use of the drug. And usually what you also, that means is that you really don't have to control the use. Just as long as you have an efficient tax system, you don't have to control and see what people are doing or not. It will be less costly. However, compared to a ban, the problem with the use of fee or a tax is that we don't really know the effect beforehand. We don't know the, the level of reduction of the use of antibiotics if we introduce a use of fee. And this is a classical problem in, in any, any type of environmental policy. With the ban, we know the effect, but it's usually very costly. With the tax, we don't know the effect, but it's usually much more cost efficient compared to that. <laughs> now I'm going to move to the doctors. So now I want to think about policies to affect doctors. And believe me, affecting doctors is not easy, <laughs> I can assure you. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to give you an example. I want to give you this example, maybe not because it's the most efficient way, but it's an illustration of a completely different way of thinking. And it's about thinking about the decision environment. And some of you might have heard the word nudge, which is actually, which is essentially what I mean that we affect the decision environment. So with the nudge, I mean that we make a very small change in the, in the decision environment in order to affect people to act in a way that we think is better. We don't ban, we don't affect the economic in incentives, we just simply change the decision environment a little bit. Let me illustrate this with two examples when it comes to doctors. This is a study where <coughs> doctors' prescription behavior were screened. And doctors' prescription behavior were evaluated by external people. And they were told how good or how bad, depending on uh, where you are on the scale, they were compared to their peers. Okay? So doctors were being told, you are really good at prescribing antibiotics. Or they were being told, you're not as good in prescribing antibiotics as your colleagues. And the idea here is, well, there are several ideas. But before I talk about the ideas, let me just be clear. We haven't changed the economic incentives at all. We haven't forbidden anything. We're just telling doctors how they are behaving compared to their peers, their colleagues. And the idea of this is, well, it's several. One is, of course, obvious. One is, right, it's pure information, right? I'm being told if I'm doing the, uh, how, how I'm doing compared to others. It's pure information. I don't think that's what's going on here to any large extent. I think to a much larger extent, it is peer comparison. I'm being told how I am behaving compared to my peers, to my colleagues. Am I a good doctor or am I a bad doctor? And what I found in this particular study, so let, no, let, let me, maybe not all of you can see, see this le uh, letter here. So, so the way it worked here was that the doctors got emails. I think it was weekly, I'm not sure, maybe it was bi-weekly, but at regular points in time, they got emails. And these emails told the doctors how they were, before, uh, how they were performing. And in this particular case, and I'll, I'm going to read this out because there are some, some important things here, here to say, the email reads, you are not a top performer. Okay? So obviously we understand there were top performers. That's the first thing you're being told. And you're being told that you're not the top performer. You are writing too many unnecessary prescriptions. Based on your most recent activity, you wrote 12 prescriptions out of 24 acute respiratory infection cases that did not warrant antibiotics. To improve your behavior, please see these guidelines. 
So it's a lot of information on what to behave, but I think the most important part here is that they're being told that some other people are much better than what they are. And of course, to be clear, some people that were good, they got a much more positive email, right? You are a top performer. You're behaving very well. So by doing this, what they found was that uh, uh, prescription of antibiotics reduced by, by, what was it, 16 percentage points. I mind you, these are doctors, as I said from the beginning, these are not people that you easily affect. But just by providing this information, you reduced uh, uh, prescription of antibiotics by 16 percentage points. Now, what I always like to point out when I see these studies is, we actually don't know for sure what prescriptions that were cut. We can't say that this was 16 percentage better. Right? Because maybe there were some necessary prescriptions that were cut. So all we know sort of is that prescription went down. The other way, and this is the same study, instead of just comparing with others, just basically asking doctors to, in the form that in this particular case played no role whatsoever, they just had to write down and justify why they were prescribing antibiotics. So to be clear, this is, this is not that, 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 uh, uh, that uh, uh, someone was checking this and saying yes or no. It's just that they needed to justify their behavior. And this would go on, on the patient's medical record. Prescription went down by 18 percentage points, so very similar to, to the first case. <laughs> so I think it, it, it is actually it is possible to affect how doctors uh, behave as well, uh, even if it might be a little bit more difficult. I heard during the break that you had talked a lot about drug development. I'm not going to talk that much about drug development, but I just want to point out something that, that sometimes raises a lot of objections. I always want to point out uh, uh, some good aspects, and that is the role of patents. So with the patent, pharmaceutical companies get basically a monopoly right for a drug for a certain period of time. Uh, and for people outside the field and for people that are not economists, this seems like a crazy idea. Because basically what this will mean is that there will be very high prices of drugs because pharmaceuticals have a monopoly power. However, one must always remember the reason for why we have a patent system, and that is that there are big benefits of having a patent system because it creates incentives for developing new drugs. Developing new drugs is very expensive. If pharmaceutical companies did not know that they could make a lot of money after they have developed a successful drug, they would not have invested these monies in developing drugs. So a patent system is a very important part of development of drugs. Now, I'm not saying that pharmaceutical companies are angels that are always doing the right thing and have always have the right prices. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that a patent system that gives them a period of time to make monopoly profit is most likely necessary, in, 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 at least in the, in the free market economy. Obviously, the cost of having a patent is that it will have a high cost for the buyers. They will have a higher price than if there was a competition. However, in the case of antibiotics, this might not be as bad <laughs> as, as for other drugs. Because in the case of antibiotics, we actually want to limit the use. So, so the high price of, of, of new antibiotics might not be as bad as if we compare with other policies. So, so my, 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 my gut solution to that would be not to screw up the patent system, but have the patent system and then use the same way of supporting poor countries as we do in other circumstances. That would mean subsidizing the drugs in, in, in that setting, not sort of affect the patent system because of that, but instead support the use of drugs there. Sort of separate those two things. <laughs>
Now, what I want to do now as a, as, a, as a closure is to then return to individual behavior. So I've talked a lot about policies, how to affect people, uh, but I, I'm always in this area interested in knowing and understanding individual behavior and why we're doing the way we're doing. So I just wanted to close very quickly uh, by by thinking a little bit and talking a little bit about why are there so big differences in, in the use of antibiotics in the world? Even comparing pretty similar countries, we can see pretty big differences in the use of antibiotics. And I just listed four, four reasons here for why that, that could be the case. Uh, I'm sure if we think about it, we can come up with a number of them. The first and foremost explanation for the use of antibiotics is most likely income. But we also know that even with, with countries that have similar levels of income, there could be pretty big differences in the use of antibiotics, which could be differences in terms of what policies we have in, in place, what the institutions are, if there is corruption, but also maybe norms that people adhere to. And what I did in a study together with some colleagues, well, actually with Gunnar that you, that you saw, saw, saw uh, previous uh, hour, was to think and actually in, in, a, in a very simple way, just ask people how they would behave under a certain setting. So we did a survey, a uh, survey-based study to a random sample of, of sweets. And we were simply interested in knowing who is willing to voluntarily abstain from taking antibiotics. And this is not for a deadly disease. Uh, it's just to, to be sick for a few more days, suffer a little bit, but not take antibiotics. We had a number of questions on the use of antibiotics. We had a number of questions on their, 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 their uh, previous use. We have a number of questions on trust in society, trust in the healthcare sector, uh, and of course, socioeconomic characteristics. And this was the scenario or the vignette question that we asked all people. For a number of bacterial infections, for example, tonsillitis, we know that the use of antibiotics will quicken your recovery. If you do not take antibiotics, you will continue to be ill for several additional days. How willing or unwilling are you to abstain from using antibiotics when possible, even if it means that you will be sick for some extra days? So it's basically asking people, are you willing to voluntarily abstain from taking antibiotics, suffering a little bit, uh, but be a good guy or girl? And then we ask the same people, what do you think others would do? Okay, same vignette question, but how do you think others would do? And these are the distribution of the answers uh, to these two questions. So when answering for themselves, 5% saying, no, 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 I'm not going to be willing to, to, to abstain from taking my antibiotics. And 30% are saying, I'm very willing to abstain from taking antibiotics. Okay. While if we ask them, well, what do you think others would do? Then they're saying, no, 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 2% would be very willing to abstain from taking antibiotics, uh, uh, while 12% would be very unwilling to take antibiotics. So as you see, it, that's the first interesting result. It's a pretty, big, big, pretty big difference between what I think I, I would do and what I think that Anne would do. I'm a much better person than Anne, so I would abstain, but she would not, right? That would be the general impression people would have. This is usually what you find in many studies, and in a way, I would say that maybe this is a more reliable way, a more reliable prediction of what people would actually do. Uh, but interestingly enough as well, it's a pretty big correlation between these two. So if I'm very willing to take antibiotics, it's more likely that I think that other people are at least fairly willing to, to, to abstain from taking antibiotics. Now, we're not super interested in the, in, the, in the distribution here of responses. Instead, what we're interested in seeing is, can we explain the distribution here? Can we, who is very unwilling and who is very willing? Are there factors? Are there individual characteristics? Are there past behavior? What factors can explain what they respond here? That's our main interest. <laughs> 
When it comes to the individual characteristics, characteristics there's essentially nothing that correlates with this. Not gender, not income, not where they live, not their education. Basically nothing explains where they end up in this response. However, their previous experiences have a pretty big impact on where they end up here. Those with the worst health status, those that have recently taken antibiotics, those that have stated being denied to take antibiotics in the, uh, uh, in the past, those that have a low level of concern about resistance, etc., are all associated with a lower willingness to, uh, 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 to abstain. It's all sort of past behavior and, and knowledge information correlate with this behavior. So what this is suggesting is that, well, maybe there are ways to affect people to increase their, their voluntary willingness to abstain, actually, by targeting on these experiences and knowledges. While, and this is more from a social science point of view, we were also interested in knowing, well, does the trust uh, 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 and expectation about others correlate with this? And when it comes to trust in society, it had no effect. When it comes to expectation about what others are doing, it had a pretty big effect on, on where they end up on this, on this distribution. So, explaining the variation here, yes, we can do that, but we cannot do it with individual characteristics. We can do it with expectation of what the others are doing and their past experience. 